So uh, I was asked to just give a short overview of the Magic API uh, in case it's useful to any of you and to see where we are with that and what our plans are for the future. Um, really know the five of us involved in this, um, this team um, as Nick introduced us. So I wasn't sure exactly how uh, far back to go in terms of describing the API, but we sort of decided to start with first fundamentals about what an API is, then I can uh, describe how the magic uh, repository fits into this Fiesta API that we're building. And then I'll describe the Fiesta API and its definition and show you some uh, examples of using the Fiesta API. Since it's such a small group, if you have questions, feel free to just unmute yourself and interrupt me, or you can type them into the chat window and one of us can help you. So what is an API and why do we need it? So API stands for an application programming interface and it's primarily intended for being used by other software rather than by humans. Um, and it's got a very strict definition that's usually a set of requests and responses that are valid. And um, it's different than other pieces of code that are often called libraries or packages or modules because they are included in the software that's being used. Um, they're either compiled or they're referenced. Whereas an API describes an interface to another piece of software that runs at the same time uh, and isn't part of the software that uses it. So there are several different types of APIs. Um, web services or web APIs are one type of API and they use the internet as their primary um, method of communication. Uh, there are several ways of implementing web APIs or web services. REST is just one of them. Um, it was a definition or description that was defined in a doctoral dissertation from a student at UC Irvine uh, in the year 2000. So it's been around for 20 years and it's widely considered the most popular um, method of implementing these web services, mainly because it's fairly unrestricted. Uh, it's got only a handful of rules um, but they are sufficient for making these um, APIs work well. So uh, the style of implementing web services are called RESTful APIs, and they uh, use these verbs, um, these, these HTTP methods or verbs for defining the types of requests that are made. So get, put, post, delete uh, are the most common ones. Um, Another property of RESTful APIs is that they're stateless and cacheable. So um, you don't get a session when you, when you use them. You can make the same call over and over again and it doesn't matter. Um, so that's the stateless component. There's nothing saved about the call on the server side. Uh, and then they're cacheable because of that. So if you make the same call twice or uh, lots of people are making a call, then it can be cached and reused which is much more efficient. Um, and the way that they work is by responding with a, a status code uh, as HTTP works normally for using the web, uh, along with some content, which is the response for the API request. So just to give you a few examples, very simple sort of uh, examples of how an API could work. Um, so making a get request to a URL, just like you would in a browser. When you go to a URL in a browser, it's actually making a GET request through HTTP. Uh, this is a URL that might return a piece of information. And instead of it being a web page, it's usually a formatted text string. It could be just plain text, or it could be JSON like this is, which is a JavaScript object notation. Uh, it could be XML, it could be a handful of different ways. As long as it's consistent, um, it's sufficient for a program to be able to use it. So the important pieces of information are usually the status code of the response, which tells you whether it's successful. Uh, HTTP has a handful of status codes that are standard. 200 means okay and successful. Um, 500 is an error on the server. 404 is um, not there. 
So you type something in wrong to your URL, for example. And then it usually has some, some content that goes with it, some stuff that you asked for. So in this case, we might have asked for a list of things that have a property one of value. And if you wanted to add to those list of things and you had the access to do so, you could issue a put request, which is different than what you would do in a browser because there's no way to do that in a browser very easily. Um, browsers can implement things like post with a form, but this is more specific to a RESTful uh, interface, a RESTful web service. And here we're creating this new thing and we're sending with it uh, in the payload a piece of information that you want to attach. So uh, it would respond with saying it's okay and it created this thing. So here the API is being used for inserting things into this website or database. And you could do the same if you have access to do so to delete uh, this thing, and then it could tell you that thing is deleted. So this is the sort of request and response that an API, uh, especially a web API defines. And one of the advantages or several of the advantages of using an API over some other method is that since it has a very well-defined and simple interface, it makes it easier for another software uh, program to use it. Um, and the output is reproducible, much more so than might be the case in a GUI. Uh, a graphical user interface might have a whole series of steps before you get to the response. And if any of those change or they're done in a different order, you might get a different output. Um, since APIs are just boiled down to a simple request and response, uh, it's much easier to make sure that they um, always get the expected response. And because of that, they're much easier to test. So you can produce more robust software if you write tests with a series of expected outcomes. Um, that's much easier to do than a graphical interface. So some use cases for having an API uh, would be for repetitive or complex tasks. So if you wanted to retrieve uh, some matches from the website on a schedule, um, that might not be something you want a human to do. You could write a, software, a piece of software or a script to do that uh, repetitively. Um, you might want to upload data from an instrument as it's being produced and perform some sort of operation on the data transform before you upload it. And if you have a script to do that, um, it would be relatively easy to just add on uh, a step to upload it at the end. And sometimes you might want to use multiple APIs from different sources. We do that on Magic, for example, to get the metadata from Crossref or to issue a data DOI um, with data site. Those are APIs that we use to, um, to do those tasks, but we also provide an API for other people to access Magic or Earthref in general. So that's a very brief background to APIs. Feel free to let me know if, if there's still questions about it. Uh, otherwise, I'll just keep going. So um, MAGIC is uh, the Magnetics Information Consortium, which is just one part of EarthRef. Uh, it's the most actively developed part of EarthRef right now, but we're working on a framework that could serve multiple communities. Uh, so we've called this the FIESTA, or the Framework for Integrated Earth Science and Technology Applications. Uh, it's essentially a series of configuration files and servers that then interact with different resources uh, on behalf of the repository that this Fiesta container defines. So magic would be uh, a configuration file that defines this backend, which is the uh, essentially the API that we just talked about in the front end, which is the website that Nick talked about. And together, these would perform a lot of the functions that a repository would have to uh, do, for example, indexing the content so you can find it or having a, a safe archive um, on AWS, minting data DOIs, retrieving me um, the metadata for references, um, controlling who has access and new registrations with ORCID, uh, identifying samples with IGSM. So all of these are relatively complex operations for a new repository to set up and to test. And having a, um, a configurable uh, system that can be used for different repositories would be useful. 
uh, to especially for these um, domains that have value, valuable data but um, are fairly small data sets or small communities that don't have the resources to set up a new repository uh, each time. So EarthRef is a collection of these uh, Fiesta repositories um, that are implemented and you can then interact with EarthRef as a whole and the Fiesta repositories can interact with each other um, as you would on a normal website. But EarthRef provides the infrastructure for running these repositories. And so we can have host multiple ones at EarthRef. Uh, for example, we have ERDA and GERM and uh, the CMAP catalog and various other repositories that are part of this umbrella architecture. So uh, in order to describe an API and to have it be useful, there's a definition for it. Uh, one of the popular definitions for a web API is using this open API standard, sometimes referred to OAS. So we have defined this uh, at the API website um, and it uses basic authentication over um, SSL, which makes it secure for logging in if you want to use your private workspace. And we have both public and private endpoints. The public ones don't need you to log in. So going to the, let's see, open this up. So just navigating to api.earthref.org will automatically uh, send you to version one. APIs tend to be versioned uh, so that you can build software against them and then be confident that they will work. If APIs decide they need to make breaking changes, they can issue a new version without breaking the, uh, the software that relies on the old version. Uh, so this documentation is defined by a uh, specification file that adheres to the open API standard. You can download the file if you're curious here. Mm -hmm. And it defines some of these requests and responses that we've talked about. Uh, one of the most simple ones is just to check to see whether the uh, website's health is okay. So you can do a health check. Actually, it needs to have the version in there. And then it will tell you that the, um, that the API is healthy. And then uh, similarly, there's uh, authentication for checking if you um, have access to certain parts of the website. There's endpoints for searching for data, which we'll uh, get to in a minute. There's three different ways of doing it. You can search and download um, a zip archive, which is similar to what Nick showed you on the search interface where you can download um, to an Excel file, or you can download, if you downloaded all of them, you'd get a zip of the individual contribution files. You could just retrieve the data um, for the contribution as a whole, but a single contribution, and it would come down uh, as a text file, for example, that you could read right away and not a zip file, or uh, the individual rows that match whatever your criteria are. So each of these definitions describes uh, the parameters that you can send to the uh, API. So one of them is a repository. Right now, the, the valid one is magic, as this is an example. Um, the table name from the description that Nick gave you about the different tables, site location, site samples. You can limit the number of rows that you get back. You can start from a, a higher row number so that you can page through the results. Uh, you could put in a query to get back um, searches that match a certain uh, string or set of strings. Uh, and then for private data, if you log in with your credentials from Earthref, you can download your private data and you can also create contributions, update them and delete them. So that was the, uh, the API description. And then using it. So as I mentioned earlier, when you go to a URL in a browser, you're issuing a GET request against whatever URL you've typed in. Uh, so you can do simple requests against an API in that way. So um, we did the health check. 
um, already. So that's that one. Uh, and then there's, you could do a search for the recent contributions. So uh, going to this URL, which matches one of the descriptions in the definition, um, it's got the repository. We're saying we want to search for the rows that match in, in the contribution table. By default, that will give you 10 results back, but it tells you that there's a total of over 4,000. And it gives you some metadata about the contribution so that you can use that to then further investigate. The important part of this is the ID, for example, so that you could uh, get data back for a specific ID. And then you could also search for sites that mention the word result. Uh, so this is a different list and it's a list of sites rather than contributions. So there are almost 20,000 of those. Uh, and again, this is a public search. So this is only activated or public uh, data sets. And then you could get data back for a specific ID or specific contribution ID. And this is the tab delimited text format for the entire contribution that matches that ID. So we could do that with any of the IDs uh, that we got back in the search uh, for that contribution. So those are just get requests. Um, we can also run more complicated requests, but in order to do that, we have to use um, some software. You can either write the software in Python or you could use some tools for executing other types of requests. Um, for Python, which is a very common uh, scripting language these days, uh, one way to run these online is using Binder or Jupyter Hub. Um, one of the major differences here is that Binder is a temporary service so that we can spin it up and run it quickly, uh, but it will disappear on its own. So there's no storage for uh, our data for working on something. If you want to have a space to work on your data uh, using the API or PMagPy, as Lisa will point out in a few minutes, um, we have a service using Jupyter Hub, which will give you a more permanent uh, workspace online. So just for uh, an example of using this, uh, I made some notebooks in this uh, GitHub repository. There's a button to launch a binder um, instance of JupyterHub. So this is a temporary uh, server that's just spinning up so that we can execute some of the code in these notebooks and test it out. So starting with the public data notebook, um, the way that these notebooks are set up, these are cells that have Python code in them. You execute one at a time. Um, I'm typing control enter to execute them. You can also um, make it execute with the run button or there are other ways. But so by executing this, I'm importing some modules. I'm defining a uh, endpoint for the API. So this is just a template that I can use for filling in the requests further down. Uh, I'm going to use the V1 version of the API and the magic repository, and then the rest I fill in each time. So here's a whole series of requests and responses. Uh, I'm using that format for the formatted um, request here by putting download into the empty, the missing string, um, and then I'm uh, trying to request an ID of A, which is invalid, and we would expect it to give back a response of an error. Um, but if I request some IDs that uh, either don't exist or ones that I know do exist, then we would expect to get back some responses. So if I start executing this at the bottom, you can see uh, we got an error back from executing this URL. Uh, again, since these are just GET requests, we can do the same thing in a browser. Uh, you'd see that you get an error message. But um, <clears throat> the, if you provide a valid ID, then you get back some data. In this case, I'm just printing the first few lines so that we can see that we've got something reasonable back. So uh, another way of doing it would be to actually download the data rather than uh, previewing it on here. Uh, in this example, we're downloading the zip file and then opening up the zip file and uh, looking at the contents. So if I execute that, then it will make it 
um, a file in a downloads file folder in Binder or in Jupyter Hub here, but it's again temporary, so we can't rely on this um, being available in the future. Uh, if you run something like this locally, then you'd have the file locally, or if you run it on the Jupyter Hub server that we provide with Earthref, then you'd have that workspace. Uh, if you wanted to load some data into a pandas data frame, there's an example of how to do that as well. This is getting some sites that match basalter sandstone and getting 50 of them. So that's working with public data. There's the downloads folder and the file that we just got by running that. Uh, with private data, it's uh, actually we'll go to the shared private one first. So this is if you had a collaborator and they gave you their private key to a contribution. In this case, this contribution happens to be in my workspace. So I, I know what the shared private key is. But the contributor could let you uh, access their data. You might want to share this with a reviewer or one of your colleagues. And using the API or using the Earthref uh, magic website, you could access the, um, the content that way. So here, we're retrieving data out of my private workspace using this share key. Um, and if I had executed this without the shared uh, private key, we would get back an error saying that that's not available. Uh, and then there's some other examples of what would happen if um, those data don't exist. Uh, so this one just tells you that there's no content and there's an error. And then um, we could retrieve data as a pandas data frame as well to manipulate it. And then for private data, um, because this re requires us to log in, um, the first steps in this notebook are to type in a username. So that's my username. I have to look up my password quickly. And then we can log in um, to So that has stored both my handle or username and password in this notebook. And then I can use that to create a contribution in my private workspace. So we just created 17015. If we go to Earthref, and look at the private workspace, there will be all it's done is created a, I think I'm logged into a different one actually. It's created an empty private contribution that we can use to put data into it. And then, which one was that one? And then, oh, and then it's also deleted it. So that's why, <laughs> that's why I didn't see it in my private workspace. So there's two steps here. We've created one and deleted one. And then we have, in this case, we have created one and uploaded some data to it using an existing contribution. So uh, I believe this one will have left a contribution in here. Yeah, so this is the new contribution that we just created with the, um, with the example. So uh, you can use, right now you can use this API for creating and deleting and editing contributions and you can use it for searching uh, shared private ones or public contributions. And, um, and you can do it in a programmatic way so that uh, you can build it into your workflow or uh, you can um, test out uh, multiple steps by doing it uh, iteratively um, in, in a Python notebook or, or in your own code. So that was a brief overview of the API. If you've got any questions, feel free to hop on. Otherwise, I think the next thing up is a brief break, and then Lisa's going to talk about JupyterHub. Well, thanks, Rupert. That was great. Um, a new feature for Magic, and uh, I think 
quite a few people are interested in using it to automate their data upload systems. So we can uh, start letting people know to be able to do Hey, Rupert, I thought that was a, a great overview of what you can do here. Um, can you give us an idea of um, how many people are using this? Are we the, uh, the magic team, the only people so far? And, uh, you know, what's the, uh, pro you know, how much do we need to help people to get, get going on this? Well, as Nick said, there's several people, several groups have shown interest in using it. Um, it's already being used uh, for authenticating users to the Jupyter Hub uh, website. So mm -hmm. um, we have used it for, for them and several of the notebooks, I think some of the PMagpie example notebooks and Lisa's uh, example, use the API endpoints for downloading uh, data. Um, so it is getting used. Um, I suspect it will get used more as the labs integrate it into their uh, data pipeline uh, for getting data prepared after uh, being produced in their lab. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and then uh, we're migrating a lot of the calls on the magic website to use the API rather than using their own methods of uh, communicating with the database. So it's becoming a more integral part to the whole um, solution. Mm -hmm. 